Warning. May contain controversial material. Also may contain swearing. Your discretion is advised. And I give up forever to touch you. Cause I know that you feel me somehow. You're the closest to heaven that I'll ever be. And I don't want to go home right now. And all I could taste is this moment. And all I can breathe is your life. Later, it's over. I just don't want to miss you tonight. And I don't want the world to see me. Cause I don't think that they'd understand. When everything's made to be broken, I just want you to know. So as I said before, Kate and Jerry were made their guidos, which are basically suspects in Portuguese. The police had a look about the apartment, dusted for prints and couldn't find anything. Nothing at all. Does make you wonder, plus there's a whole load of other little things that don't add up about the parents, so we'll um, have a look at these. Kate's first words to Jerry were, they've taken her, new claims that the nanny made. Who's taken her? How did she know that? And the pyjamas. These are the clothes that Madeline was apparently wearing when she was abducted, or when she was sleeping that night at least. These are supposed to be Amelie's, or sisters, that are smaller. Now Kate McCann went to great pain to tell everybody that these were in fact Amelie's, but when they were shown to Amelie, Amelie turned around and said they were Maddie's pyjamas and where's Maddie? And another weird thing, the McCann's already had pictures of the pyjamas ready. They'd already taken pictures of them a few days previous and had them ready and set for TV. And this is the picture in question that they took of the pyjamas. And if you look behind the pyjamas, the fabric looks very much like the, the fabric and colour of the settee that was in the apartment. And also Kate washed the pyjamas before it was shown on TV because there was a tea stain on them. Now why would you do that? I know, it's just a tea stain. I don't get it. I really don't get that. Unless she seems to be covering up for something. See, my thoughts on this case have jumped the fence from one side to the other a few times. To begin with, I really did think it was the parents. Um, the one thing that struck me was the behaviour of the parents. They didn't act like they were a family that just lost a child, you know. It didn't seem right. Um, their mannerisms and everything. Um, but. Then again, they were told by the police that not to show any emotion on TV because whoever tamed her could get off on it. I don't know, I don't know. How do you deal with the fact that more and more people seem to be pointing the finger at you saying the way you behave is not the way people would normally behave if their child is abducted and they seem to imply that you might have something to do with it? To be honest, I don't actually think that is the case. I think that's a very small minority of people that are criticising us. Um, you know, the facts are out there. We were dining very close to the children and we were checking on them very, very regularly. Um, you know, we are very responsible parents and we love our children so much. And I think it's only a very few people that are actually um, criticising us. I have never heard before that uh, anyone considers us suspects in this and um, the 
Portuguese police certainly don't and um, without getting into too much detail uh, about the circumstances we were with a large group of people um, and you know there is absolutely no way Kate and I are involved in this abduction. These are actually Amelie's pyjamas, they're the same but obviously they're smaller. Um, the top is a pink top and it has the character Eeyore on and short sleeves. And the bottoms, as you can see, are, are white with the small floral pattern and Eeyore again on the bottom right of the leg. So these are actually, apart from the size and the button at the back which Madeline's doesn't have, these are actually the pyjamas that Madeline was wearing when she was taken. And everything we have done has been by taking counsel from experts around us, but we were advised that generally raising awareness of a disappearance will help in the search for that person. It helped Kate and I, and we have taken strength, not just from the people who have supported us, but we have taken strength ourselves by being active in the search. And I think, you know, if we had, for example, stayed indoors, locked ourselves away and just waited and waited and waited for a month, we would be shells of the people we are. Richard B. Hall also had a behaviour specialist look at Kate and Jerry, body language, movements, everything. This is what the findings were. But first, for four years, Kate and Jerry McCann have lived a never-ending ordeal and they still don't know when or if it'll ever end. It began on a family holiday in Portugal when Madeline, their four-year-old daughter, simply vanished. She hasn't been seen since. Tonight, the mystery deepens. You're about to see home video never shown before and learn the vital clue Madeline left behind. Here's Ronnie Sadler. Okay, spin it around, darling. Okay, right round. Oh, yes, I can see your wings. It's a big smile. <laughs> oh, yes. One more big smile. That's pretty. She was an incredibly beautiful baby, actually. You sound like the most biased parents on the planet now, but she, she was just really compact and just a really kind of nice, round, perfect head and... You know, and then, then she then, opened her mouth and <laughs> the whole world knew she was uh, with us. This would not be considered a, a blatant past tense use of the verb was. Uh, here she says, she was incredibly beautiful baby, actually. One could argue that she, at age three, she's no longer a baby and that they are referring to a period of when she was born. And that would be an appropriate use of the past tense. So I don't assign to this a red flag because of the context. It does concern me at this point, it's just a little bit of alarm now, that in an interview of a missing child, they're talking about her in the past tense. I expect some form of follow-up that will be in the present tense. A single slip into past tense is an indicator a belief or knowledge that the child is deceased. And that's what's concerning about that. But there are also some other things that are, that, that are there that aren't any major blaring red, red flags, but as they build point after point, they become concerning. One of the things is this. Parents of missing children who show guilty knowledge of what happened to the child will often find a subtle way of insulting the child, insulting the victim, blaming the victim, disparaging the victim. When someone is missing, like or when a child is deceased, we call it the angelic view. The child is elevated beyond any normal child. It just, everything is wonderful. And we hear the subtle disparagement in guilty parents, uh, Casey Anthony actually called her little daughter a name, a derogatory name. Um, in shaken baby ca syndrome cases, the baby wouldn't stop crying as if it was the baby's fault. The baby wouldn't take her formula as if the baby was at fault. And what that is, 
and guilty statements, within human nature, there is some drive to justify what happened, to clear oneself. So I don't like the um, several things about this. I don't like a past tense reference without following up present tense. It continued there. And we have a praising of the baby that I do like. And then when she opened her mouth, the whole world knew she was with us. It's a subtle way of saying that she was really loud. I'm not sure that sounds like praise. I have six children. Um, I have two grandchildren. And I listen to the words of parents regularly. And given the setting of an interview where her, the child is missing, it's not something I expected to hear. Now, it's not a point I'm going to hang my hat on, but I've been called to the attention now that maybe Madeline was a little bit loud for them. It's a really strange place to be giving even a small complaint. I said McCann level volume. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. So Kate was asked 48 questions by the police, to most of which she didn't reply. Here they are here. Question 1. When asked on the 3rd of May 2007 at around 10pm when she entered the apartment, what she saw and what she did, where she searched and where she handled, she did not reply. Question 2. If she looked inside the couple's bedroom wardrobe, she said she would not reply. Question 3. When shown two photographs of her bedroom's wardrobe and requested to describe its contents, she did not reply. Question 4. When asked the reason why the curtain behind the sofa under the side window, whose photograph was shown to her, is ruffled, she did not reply. She did not reply to the question if somebody passed behind that sofa. Question 6. When asked how long she had searched inside the apartment after detecting the disappearance of her daughter Madeline, she did not reply. Question 7. When asked why she said right away that Madeline was abducted, she did not reply. Question 8. Presuming that Madeline had been abducted, why she left the twins alone at home to go to the tapas and raise the alarm, even because the supposed abductor might still be in the apartment, she did not reply. Question 9. Why she did not ask the twins right away what had happened to their sister, or why she did not ask them later on, she did not reply. Question 10. When questioned about having raised the alarm at the tapas, what exactly she said, which words she used, she did not reply. Question 11. When asked about what happened after she raised the alarm of the tapas, she did not reply. Question 12. When asked whether she had a mobile phone at her at the moment, she did not reply. Question 13. When asked why she went to alarm her friends instead of shouting from the balcony, she did not reply. Question 14. When asked who contacted the authorities, she did not reply. Question 15. When asked who participated in the searches, she did not reply. Question 16. When asked if anyone outside of the group learned about Madeline's disappearance during the following moments, she did not reply. Question 17. When asked if any neighbour had offered to help after the alarm about their disappearance, she did not reply. Question 18. When asked what the expression, we let her down means, she did not reply. Question 19. When asked if Jane mentioned to her that she had seen a man with a child that night, she did not reply. Question 20. When asked how the authorities were contacted and which police force was alerted, she did not reply. Question 21. When asked during the searches and already with the police present in the locations Madeline was searched for, how and in what manner, she did not reply. 
Question 22. When asked why the twins did not wake up during the search or when they were taken to the upper floor, she did not reply. Question 23. When asked whom she phoned after the fax, she did not reply. When asked if she had phoned Sky News, she did not reply. Question 25. When asked about the danger of phoning the media, alerting them about the abduction, which could have an effect on the abductor, she did not reply. Question 26. Questions if they requested the presence of a priest, she did not reply. Question 27. When asked about the manner in which Madeline's face was divulged, if through photographs or other media, she did not reply. Question 28. When asked if it is true that during the search she remained sat on her bed inside the bedroom without moving, she did not reply. Question 29. When asked about her behaviour that night, she did not reply and questioned about whether or not she was able to sleep. She did not reply. Question 30. When asked before the trip to Portugal, she made a comment about bad presentiment or presages. She did not reply. Question 31. When asked about Madeline's behaviour, she did not reply. When asked if she suffered from any illness or took some medication, she did not reply. Question 32. When asked about Madeline's relationship with her siblings, friends and schoolmates, she did not reply. Question 33. When asked about her professional life and at how many and which hospitals she had worked, she did not reply. Question 34. Being a doctor and questioned about her speciality, she did not reply. Question 35. When asked about whether she worked shifts at the emergency room or any other service, she did not reply. Question 36. If she worked every day, she did not reply. Question 37. When asked at a given moment she quit working and why, she did not reply. Question 38. When asked if it is true that her twin children have difficulty in falling asleep, that they are restless and that it upsets her, she did not reply. Question 39. When asked whether or not it is true that sometimes she felt desperate over her children's behaviour and that it upset her very much, she did not reply. Question 40. When asked whether or not it is true that in England she considered the possibility of handing over Madeline's guardianship to a relative, she did not reply. Question 41. When asked if at home in England she gave her children medication and what kind of medication, she did not reply. Question 42. During the session, several dog inspection movies of forensic character were shown to her, where the dogs can be seen marking human cadaver odour and human blood traces, and only of human type, and the comments of the expert that headed the diligence can be heard. Question 43. After watching and after the cadaver odour was signalled in her bedroom next to the window and behind the sofa that was pulled against the living room window, she said that she cannot explain more than what she has al mentioned already. Question 44. Also marked. Now by the human blood detection dog behind the aforementioned sofa, she said that she cannot explain more than what she has mentioned already. Question 45. With the cadaver odour being signalled in the vehicle that they rented approximately one month after the disappearance, licence plate 59DA27, she said that she cannot explain more than what she has mentioned already. Question 46. When confronted with the results of the collection of Madeline's DNA, whose analysis was carried out by a British lab behind the sofa and in the vehicle's boot, situations that were explained above, she said that she cannot explain any more that what she has mentioned already. 
question 47. When asked if she had any responsibility or intervention in her daughter Madeline's disappearance, she did not reply. Question 48. When questioned if she wants to add anything, she replied negatively. When asked if she is aware of the fact that by not replying to these questions asked, she places the investigation which seeks to find out what happened to her daughter at risk. She replied yes, if that is what the investigation thinks. <laughs> semanas de investigación dio un giro radical porque se hallaron en el apartamento eh, minúsculos restos de sangre. Cuando vosotros os enteráis de eso, de que la policía ha descubierto sangre en el apartamento, ¿cómo reaccionáis? You know what? This is all investigation. For this next part, I want to speak about the cadaver dogs that were brought in. They alerted many points over the bedroom and, well, the whole apartment, really. Um, before we get into the McCann one, though, I want to remind you about a certain case that happened not long ago. Chris Watts actually did a video on it as well, so you can go back and watch that if you like. I'll show you a little bit here, but fair enough, the dogs didn't prove that Chris Watts killed his family, but... You can see, as they were going nuts in the background, yeah, well, I think it must have rided on Chris's um, guilty conscience, and it's one of the reasons why he gave in and admitted he killed his family. Just watch. Uh, Chris Watts, W-A-T-T-S. Uh, what, what's going on right now around your house? Right now, it's yeah, canine units, the sheriff's department. Everybody's like they're they're doing their best right now to figure out like if they can get a scent, and see where they went. If they went on foot, they went in a car, they went somewhere. And right now, it's just like they've they've been on point. They're going through the house trying to get a scent, and hopefully, they can pick something up to where it's it's going to lead to something. What happened? I she like she came home from the airport at 2 a.m. and I left around 5:15. She was still here, and like about 12:10 in that afternoon, her friend Nicole showed up at the door. Like I had texted Shannon a few times that day, called her, say you know, but she never got back to me. But she was not get back to any of her people as well, and that's what really concerned a lot of people. Is like if she's not getting back to her. Like if she doesn't get back to me, that's fine. Like she gets busy during the day. But she didn't get back to her people, which was very concerning. And Nicole called me when she was at the door, and that's when I came home. And then walked in the house, and nothing was vanished. Nothing was here. I mean, she wasn't. She wasn't here. The kids weren't here. No, nobody was here. What's your wife's name? Shannon. S H A N A N N. What's your What's your kids? Bella and Celeste. Celeste. Uh, C E L E S T E. How old are you? How old are you? Daughter? Four. Bella's four. Celeste is three. And so, how many times did you try calling her? I called her three times, texted her about three times, just to say, you know, what's going on? Like, I did, I could after that for the after I called her and texted her once, it's like, like, maybe she was just busy. Like, it, she just got back, you know. Like, everybody's probably calling her from her trip. She just got back from Arizona, and I figured just yeah, she was just busy. But when her friend showed up, that's what it was like. It, it registered like, all right, this isn't right. And we all know that Chris admitted to killing his family. As he admitted, I think it was the, the dogs, though, that <laughs> really did play on his guilty conscience. Anyway, let's have a look at the, the, the McCann dogs that were brought in. I quite believe them as well. Yeah. <laughs> 
This was something even the British newspapers picked up on. Although there was only one dog in the video, there was two on site. Eddie and Kayla, both dogs were trained to sniff the odour of blood and cadaver. Not pork like many think for some reason. And as you see here, Kayla is even hired out for to the forces for £530 a day, plus expenses. Screen the vehicles using the um, using the dog, and the only reaction we've had is to the car in the far corner. And what we have is a reaction from the dog over here, where his head's up in the air, and he's sent in the the the, um, the items that he's trained to find. And when we tie him down, he picks this car or this dog. The important thing to realise is that he's picking the the scent that's coming out through the seal of the door. victim recovery dog into the uh, apartment um, and by um, experience and the training of the dog what I first noticed is that as soon as I came in um, the, the dog's uh, very excited um, and as a handler I can pick up his um, body language etc and it would appear to me that as soon as he's come in the in the house um, he's picked up a scent that he recognises. The second dog that we've seen work today is the crime scene dog, Keela. Um, she will only indicate to me when she's found human blood. indication where she freezes in this spot here which would indicate to me that there is some human blood there um, she will find blood that's historically very old um, 
and she will find anybody's blood, any human blood, yeah. which is important to make sure that everybody knows. Um, the fact that it, there's um, uh, other scientific methods being used may stop you recovering any DNA, um, but if you try, uh, we'll see what happens. Um, but she is very, very good, and when she indicates, there is always... So, the dog's alerted 17 times around the apartment and in the rental car. Well, the McCanns had an interview for the uh, Portuguese news and this was their reaction and answer to all this. Hello Kate, hi Jerry. You've called us here or invite us here to show these two new pictures of uh, how Madeline might look like now at the age of six and also to watch a video, a new appeal video, but you have been recently together in Lisbon. Have you truly felt that the Portuguese public opinion is still with you? I think obviously there's been a lot of detriment, very negative, and uh, it's inevitable that given how much, so much was written negative about us that some people would have uh, felt that we were involved, but we do feel now that uh, legal action has been taken and that the judicial processes are saying that there's no evidence to support what's been written. We're talking about Gonzalo Morel's book. Yeah, but also with the publication of the file in the first place. Uh, in the initial process of the criminal uh, file and regarding Madeline's disappearance, that, you know, there's no evidence that we were involved, and subsequently the action we've taken recently. But uh, I think people are now prepared to continue the search for, for Madeline, and that's why we're, we're here today asking people to help us try and get this very important message. But how can you explain that Gonzalo Moral uh, has sold over 175,000 copies defending that you played a key role in Madeline's disappearance? I mean, I think it's important to remember, Sandra, the only victim in all of this is Madeline. Um, and, and that's obviously why we're here today, really. We're trying, to, we're trying to reach that person who knows something. And there is somebody who knows something. Not the person who's taken Madeline, but the, the person on the periphery. And that might just be um, a colleague of the person, a neighbour, a family. You know, this person, the abductor, has got a mother, a brother, a cousin, a part of the family. So do you believe that uh, the public opinion uh, in, Portug in Portugal right now, after reading the book of Gonzalo Moral, um, still can support you, still can uh, answer to that appeal? Yeah, that's a key point why we've taken action, Sandra, and uh, that's part of the legal process, as you know. There's already an injunction out against the book. He's uh, banned from uh, repeating his thesis that Madeline is dead and people involved. Now, that has been two separate judges plus the original judge in the file that have said that. That's where we will do the discussing of facts. That's the correct place to discuss concerns. And you think that Gonzalo doesn't have a right to uh, uh, share his opinion, his conviction under the evidence he gathered? Uh, into a book. He, do, he doesn't have a freedom of expression to say that and there's, to publish it. There's a difference between having freedom of expression and evidence to support a theory. What the judges have said, there isn't evidence to support his theory, so he shouldn't be saying it. And that's about as much as we want to say about him. You know, that's a legal process. We've challenged it. It's been through the judicial process, and that's the correct... But the files were closed, and no thesis, uh, thesis won. How can you explain that after Gonzalo Moral, Paulo Rebelo, the next uh, investigator, also pursued his thesis? He also investigated the possibility of you both play the key role in that That's that the key thing, isn't it? It was investigated, the evidence was presented to the judiciary, and the judiciary concluded there was no evidence to support that thesis. That's very no DNA, but how do you explain no, 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 the coincidence between the DNA Senate? is only one aspect of it. There was no evidence to support our involvement in Madeline's disappearance. That's the key thing. Madeline is still missing. We are here as her family to continue the search. Now, I can't speak for the people who've read the book, but obviously it doesn't stand up to critical appraisal. But this 
this is the first time that you give us uh, a big interview, uh, not being a Guido's, not being a Guido since then. Uh, so now I feel free to ask you this directly. Uh, how can you explain the coincidence of the scent of the cadaver, of cadaver felt by British and not Portuguese dogs? Sandra, maybe you should ask the judiciary because they've examined all this. But don't you have an explanation for I mean, we're asking Madeline's mum and dad and we're desperate for people to help us find Madeline, which is why we're here today. The majority of people are inherently good and I believe the majority of people in Portugal are inherently good people and we're asking them if they'll help us spread this message to that person or people. So you don't have any explanation for that? Ask the dogs, Sandra. Ask the dogs, no, Jerry. Now I think that I, f I feel free to ask you. Uh, don't you feel free to answer me? I can tell you that we've also looked at evidence about uh, cadaver dogs and they're incredibly unreliable. Unreliable? Cadaver dogs, yes. That's what the evidence shows if they are tested scientifically. You read the files, Kate? Yes, I have read the files. What did shock you most? Any part of the, any detail that you weren't uh, aware of? Something that has really surprised you? Or you didn't find... Well, I've been through them and I've made notes and I've passed that on to our investigation team, obviously. And you found any, any evidence? of anything. Well obviously the only evidence that I want to find is who's taken Madeline and where she is and they're the key things and until we, we actually get that, that bit of information then you know we're always going to feel like we're a long way away but basically what we're doing is trying to get as much information as we can and try and put the jigs jigsaw together so finally we've got the complete picture. And what about your friends? Did you have a pact of silence with your friends? Do you know judicial secrecy? <laughs> I know it, but we don't have it anymore. You have to put it into context of the situation that we were in. But now that, is the time that, to, that, to that you to explain that all. That article that was written in June was directly as a result of a journalist phoning all of us and saying, what can you tell us about it? And we were under explicit instructions that we were not to talk about uh, the details of the case under judicial secrecy. So that's all that people did. And um, I don't think, you know, there should be considered a pact of silence. We were told that's what we were to do. And you wouldn't expect witnesses in other cases in any country to be going out divulging information that may be useful to the perpetrator of the, of the crime. Well, it's for you to make your mind up yourself. I'm only trying to point out these things. There is still a lot more to come. Next episode, I'll be showing you exactly where the dogs were alerting and if there was any evidence found. Until next time, if you like my videos, please like and subscribe. Links down below for Patreon as well if you're feeling generous. And please check out my live stream, my other channel, Mr. Self Destructs, March of the Pigs. See you next time.